You are listening to Hit Play, Not Pause, a feisty menopause podcast for active, performance-minded women. I am your host, Celine Yeager. Each week, I bring you advice from athletes, scientists, researchers, and other experts to help you feel and perform your best, no matter what your hormones are doing. This show is a production of Live Feisty Media. Hello, strong, feisty women. I hope you all are well. And if you are in the U.S., I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. I just wanted to take a moment here and say I am thankful to each and every one of you who listen and share and are part of this incredible, supportive community. During the past few weeks, I've had the opportunity to hang out with some of you in real life, first at a Spartan Stadium event in Fenway Park in Boston, which is basically a 5K through the stadium, so, you know, a billion stairs and 20 obstacles ranging from spear throws to wall climbs and all sorts of antics. And it was super fun and honestly transformational for a lot of women who were taking on something like this for the very first time. And on the heels of that, we also had our feisty menopause performance retreat in Lake Nona with Dr. Vonda Wright, which was also an amazing time. And again, transformational. You know, lots of midlife women haven't ever learned how to lift heavy or do box jumps or all this stuff that can look really intimidating. And it's easy to think, oh, that's not for me. But when someone literally shows you the ropes, and I mean, literally, one of the women learned how to climb a rope right before that Boston event, you see that you can, and a whole world opens up to you that you didn't even know existed. So my heart is full, and I just wanted to share that. And again, share my gratitude with you and say how much I appreciate you all. Speaking of sharing and full hearts, this week's show has a whole lot of that. I had a chance to sit down with elite Canadian runner and high performance coach, Sasha Golish, and talk all about how she is learning to conquer and sometimes make peace with what she calls her hormonal peri monster, which she sometimes embodies with a sock puppet on her wonderful Instagram videos that I highly, highly recommend you check out. I will drop a link to that in the show notes because I cannot do them justice in words here. A few years ago, Sasha started experiencing some symptoms that had her wondering what the hell was up with her body. Crime scene, or as she called them, fire hose periods, strange memory lapses, Times in races where her legs were flailing and her muscles just felt like they weren't responding the way they typically would as she struggled to find her usual stride. And she was like, I'm either really sick or something is going on with me. And that something, you guessed it, is perimenopause. And after suffering alone for a bit, she decided that she needed to be open and to share her experiences on Instagram, not only for her own mental health, but so other women didn't feel alone or invisible in their own struggles. Golish, who is 41 now, has a substantial resume of world and national records, including setting the world record in the women's 40 plus indoor mile last year and setting two Canadian masters indoor records earlier this year at the Hal Brown last chance qualifier, running the 1500 in 428.12 and the 3000 in 936.34, smashing the previous women's 40 record by 17 seconds. So she is still kicking ass as she continues to line up and tame her hormonal peri <laughs> her hormonal peri monster and we talk about how, what she thinks, what she's doing going forward, and what she recommends, all of that in this episode, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. All right, before we get to it, give me a follow on Feisty Menopause at Instagram and Facebook. Sign up for my free weekly newsletter at feistymenopause.com. Check out the cool new Watch the Women Feisty merchandise we have just in time for the holidays that's at womensperformance.com slash fan club i will put a link to that in the show notes for you to check out we have sweatshirts and hats and all kinds of goods and if you like the show do me a favor give us a review on apple podcasts i have a couple of really 
baller guests coming up in the new year. And your positive reviews have helped me continue to grow the show and bring in just the best guests. So I appreciate appreciate it. I appreciate you. If you haven't already, go ahead and give a review on Apple. All right. Last thing, quick thanks to NutriSense for their continued support. Maintaining healthy glucose levels is key for good menopausal health and longevity. And you can learn what yours look like and how to manage them by spending some time with the CGM. It helped me a lot. So thanks, NutriSense. I appreciate it. Thanks for your support. Okay, enough of me. Let's have a few words about our awesome sponsors and get on with the show. All right, Sasha. I hit record, so now we're going to have start having our show here. I am really, really psyched to have you here. And um, you know, I had Camille Heron on. She's actually going to be on this week on the show. And it's just so so very exciting to me to see women like Camille, like yourself, speaking so openly, because like even three years ago when I started this show, that was not the case. Like people were not, you know, it. I would ask someone about being on the show and they'd be like, you want to talk about what, you know, maybe, maybe I don't want to talk about that. And it's just really, it's really opened up a lot. And what the work that you're doing is, is really helping that. And I just wanted to start all this by just saying, thanks. Well, and thank you. I mean, as I started to think about how I was going to post, I mean, you're the leader and, you know, I, I drew inspiration from you as well. And it was, how do I build upon this story? How do I tie into this story as well? And how do I amplify, you know, Camille's voice, your voice, Devin Yanko's voice, and my voice, so that we have this collective voice that's, you know, singing nuance together, um, but helping myself feel seen so that maybe other people feel seen too. That's what it, that is 100% what it's all about. <laughs> and I say it over and over again, but it's so true that even if nothing changes and you still have crime scene level periods and you still feel terrible <laughs> and you haven't figured it out. Like just knowing you're not alone and you're part of a community yeah. makes it all better. And I hear it over and over. And it's just true. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent true. Speaking of you have like your voice. I, I really love your voice because I, I like comedy. I like being funny myself. <laughs> and I think, if you know, I like, I like your takes cause they're really funny. I mean, you have, you, there was a one where you're like, when should I wear this cute white outfit? And then a the <laughs> person comes in all in red and it's like, maybe never. And it's the same, like, plan, you know, planning, you know, your marathon training as a woman with all these hormone things going on. And like the one with the tampon string was all time. <laughs> oh my God, because I had the worst rope burn from my <sighs> first Iron Man. <laughs> like, and it never even occurred to me that that would right. happen. And I was like, Oh, like when I went to pee and I was like, what is that? <laughs> what is that oh. feeling? <laughs> like, I will never urinate again. <laughs> like, it hurts so much. <laughs> so well, I, I mean, have... like the chemistry in me is like, well, oh my gosh, like, oh, the urea and the like acidity of that. Oh, sorry. So anyways, like science brain happening here, but ow. Oh, it hurts so bad. And, and, you know, it's, and then you're in that point where you're like, at some point it'll go numb and I won't have to deal with it. <laughs> you know, it's going to hurt so bad that it will just stop hurting until it does again. Which is a long way to ask, like, has contending with these female issues, if you will, like take the menstrual cycle before you hit this perimenopausal point. Is that something that you've always spoken to so openly? Or is like, has that just entered the forefront of your mind now that, things are getting a little uh, spicy, so we should. Spicy is a good one. Uh, it's a great question. And, you know, I don't, yeah, that's kind of like a question I have to reflect upon. So the short answer is, I think I've been talking about this for a while, but not as well on social media, mm -hmm. but within my clusters of friends. So, you know, for instance, when Alison Desir got her bike, I emailed her, you know, like a list of things like, hey, just as an FYI, like cycling shorts, right? Like, things are right. Like our anatomy is a little bit different than male anatomy. And if the company that you're getting shorts from really focuses on males, you just, you might get some chafing in some places you never thought of. And you talk about a tampon string. I was like, just as an FYI, like tampon strings, you know, along with the chafing of depending on where the seam is can really go sideways. And 
you know, like I got a chuckle back from her. She's like, but I never would have thought of that. Um, and so like one, I have a whole host of Instagram videos in my head. I do not know, like, there's just so many things on the go. And like, I don't have a video crew like here to help me out, but I'm like, I got to get all these on social media. So like people can share, but I, you know, thinking back, like I remember when Sarah Lesko of Wazelle and Bras for Girls, she was injured and she was running on the alter G. And I was like, Hey, heads up you know, like, here's some things that you got to think about in terms of shorts when you put on these, like, I can't remember, like the wetsuit diaper, I think is what I called it with like how it gets so sweaty. Right. And then like, I had a terrible tampon experience in that one day. I was like, you know, I know that you're going through like end of perimenopause and into menopause, potentially post-menopause, but like, if you have a tampon string and it slides down your leg in those, you know, wetsuit diaper, like the chafing from that is the next level. And then you're like stuck in there. And like, you're like, do I stop running? Do I just like let this sweat keep stinging? So, you know, I guess the short answer is yes. I think I've been talking about it, but more insularly. And it was sort of this year that I was like, I need to talk about this outside of my circle because I'll learn from people. Um, and hopefully they'll learn from the hilarious mistakes that I've made too. I've also discovered that it can pull the tampon out if it gets totally. <laughs> if it gets mm-hmm. wedged mm-hmm. enough mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you keep which is as delightful as that might sound um yeah i went personally i went to menstrual cups after that which i will confess when i was in college and the women would use them they were like the kind of women that would collect their menstrual period and like dump it on their plants and maybe onto the earth right. and say you know say chance around it so I was just like I always thought that was something maybe not for me but it changed everything like I really right like I should have tried this sooner well I mean interestingly enough I went to an IUD and so it was I was sort of like adjusting to the IUD and I was like well I know now longer need a cup so I'm not gonna buy one to sit on a shelf but I have my next underwear which also, interestingly enough, oh. I won't wear in the alter G because it's already like too hot and maybe too much information. But like, I basically just like wear bike shorts with a black liner. I'm like, well, it's absorbent. It's going to go in the wash. It's fine. Great. hundred percent. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, that's, yeah. yes. We're, there are many of us with you there. <laughs> so you give, let's move into the you know, slide into the transition, if you will. You give a really great account of when you realized that your body was starting to change in a story um, that you were quoted in quite heavily in Women's Running. And I'd love to you for you to share that a bit here, you know, just that that moment where you're like, something's changing. Um, hilariously, I actually just got back from a run in the shirt where I was like, oh, so I sort of had this like precipice moment where it was like things had kind of like really fallen off. And I think if I had looked back and I think I said this in the article, I would have seen more of the signs, but we don't talk about the signs. So not knowing what the signs are to be able to then sort of be aware of the signs, which is why I'm being more vocal. So I came back from this run and I was like, this shirt chafes me. Like, why are the seams so terrible? And then I was like, it's not the shirt, it's me. And so it was the really dry skin and I got really dry skin kind of behind my armpits where Mm -hmm. women typically put, and now I understand why, like why behind my armpit, not in my armpit, not on top of my shoulder, but sort of in the, you know, turkey wedge part of your arm. Does it have to be so dry? Because I like felt around on the shirt and I was like, there's no seam there. There's nothing there. The only thing chafing is my skin. And then it was this like, oh, well, maybe that's why that's, you know, these are the symptoms of perimenopause. I had these like unbelievably achy joints. And I said this to somebody yesterday, they weren't like 10 out of 10 ache. It was sort of in this like 0.5 to 2 out of 10 ache, but it was constant. And when I would run, it would make me feel incompetent. And what, what I mean by that is I couldn't find my stride. And so I don't know if it was because of the pain or sort of like changing body again, that I couldn't find my foot strike to like find the cadence that I was looking for, for a certain efficiency. And I found it again, and that's been great. Um, And I think the other hilarious one that's in there is, um, I think I described my muscles, and I don't know if it was quoted as this, but they felt like um, mashed potatoes wrapped in burlap. And so they just didn't, they were strong. And I knew they were strong, but I was in the gym and lifting and that was going really well. And I could like feel that they were strong, but they just didn't seem to fire in a way that I could get them to work with my body. And I was like, okay, I'm either really sick or something else is going on. And I actually reached out, this isn't in the article, but I reached out to a really good friend of mine, Jen Saigo. 
um, and she will become Dr. Jen Saigo at the end of this year. So Jen is a dietitian and IOC sports trained uh, nutritionist. And Jen was like, Gaulish, you know, you're a middle and long distance runner. I'm really a long distance runner now, but I'd still like to go to middle. Just missed the 1500. And Jen was like, I just, I wanna kind of go through the reds template with you. And one of the big challenges is the overlap in reds and perimenopause. There are a couple big things that stand out. So one, my period was still, quotation marks, regular. It was a crime scene um, and the days were shortening. So I believe it's the luteal phase that after um, egg drop, um, we all, I also got a really funny text message from a friend that it's actually like your Charlie Brown Christmas tree egg drop, right? Just sad set of ornaments here falling. But that window shortens between egg drop and period, right? And so that's a, that's a definitive sign of perimenopause. And what I didn't have was, yes, I had joint pain, but I wasn't having bone stress and bone reactions. And so my joints were healthy. Um, and then looking at the blood work, um, my estrogen was down and my DHES, which is a sex hormone in no world, am I gonna try to pronounce that? But it was like on this continual decrease over the last year. And so Jen was like, you're in perimenopause. It's true, you're young, but you're in perimenopause. And it was this moment of like, fine, I fell off a precipice and there were all of these signs and symptoms. And then I had to sort of figure out like, how am I gonna move through this in a way that's positive so that I can move forward in life? Cause you know, like in a sense you're suffering, but there, this, you can get control of your symptoms and we're all different and there's gonna be a super nuanced way to do that. But I knew that with professional help and like people who are experts in this, I was gonna get control of this. So step one, and I a little bit like took my own hands. I was like, I'm gonna get an IUD, right? Like my progesterone is down. I'm gonna get a progesterone IUD. I know it's gonna be horrible and it's gonna be the worst pain I've ever experienced in my life, but I'm gonna get an IUD. It sure was the worst experience and painful thing I've ever had. Take all of the drugs that you can ladies to relax your uterus as they shove this foreign object in there that is then gonna live there for five to seven years. Um, so yeah, and I, I guess the one thing that was also in there that I would be remiss not to, to talk about is brain fog. Mm. And one of the things I've connected recently with brain fog was imposter syndrome. And so I would go to sit down and do a task and I would forget what that task was. And then I would have this spiraling of emotions of, well, I'm just not good enough and I shouldn't be at this job and they should hire somebody else who is smarter, better, faster, stronger, et cetera, to do the work that I'm doing. And when I got control of brain fog, um, the imposter syndrome sort of seemed to disappear. Listen, I still have imposter syndrome and it's a privilege to have imposter syndrome most of the time, right? Like someone's invited you into a space where you don't feel like you belong, but they think that they know that you're the expert and that you can speak to something or represent something. And so it is a privilege to have imposter syndrome that way. But this was imposter syndrome from, I have brain fog and it's my own emotions playing with me. And so teasing those two out to be like, okay, how do I deal with this imposter syndrome? Because I know how to deal with the one when I feel like I don't belong. Um, yeah, that's a long-winded answer for you. <laughs> no, it's a great answer. How did you deal with the um, brain fog? Oh my gosh, uh, Dr. Stacy Sims, thank you very much. I love <laughs> you. Uh, ashwagandha. So I guess what was happening in the mornings is I would have this like critical cortisol spike. And it was, so I was using Inside Tracker um, for quite a while. And they would, I would have someone show up at my house between 6.30 and 6.40 AM. Um, and I would usually get up an hour before that. And I, every time my cortisol was just like, they're like, your numbers are through the roof. And I was like, pretty relaxed. I know exactly what's going on here. And so I started taking ashwagandha when I got up in the morning. And so all of a sudden I don't have this cortisol spike. It's much more leveled out. So I don't have this brain fog. So I don't have this imposter syndrome. And so, um, simple step has been life-changing for me. And I, you know, anecdotally fine. Like I don't have like perfect evidence and blood draws and whatnot, but good enough. And from other friends of mine, they're finding similar effects too. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I, I started using it too with, for another symptom that you talk about with, um, when you talk about your hormone monster and I really love your <laughs> hormone monster, which is like the sock monkey <laughs> stuff. <Yeah. laughs> like it's, it just warms my heart to see you talking to your hormone monster. Um, but you talk about like the 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 anxieties and 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 the insecurities and all that stuff that just bubbles up. And like I had started using those adaptogens like that for that because that was my first 
symptom that I had no idea until like literally more than a year or so down the road that that's it just wasn't me losing my mind you know or just finally coming right. undone <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah. um how like has that also helped with the anxiety part of it probably so you know like I anxious about different things and you know I was always praised as a child for being intelligent and good at math and good at science and so I think when I had that cortisol spike in the morning and then this brain fog where I couldn't do the math and science that I was doing supposed to be doing for work that would sort of like feed into the anxiety loop and then I would have anxiety around things that I probably shouldn't have had anxiety around so I think the short answer is yes um I actually so like for my run today I'm the person that stops and does drills in the middle of the street. Why? Because drills are so important at like keeping my efficiency and I just love them. Let's just, okay, I just love doing drills. And this man who is doing some rock work at a neighbor's house was like, you are so happy. And I was like, I am, it's 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning and it's bright and sunny and I'm running. Like what's not to be happy about? He's like, point. But when you sort of are in that anxiety spiral, you can have some of those feelings and connections in nature, but you don't sort of like get the super high of it because it's it's a little bit muted because you're still like, well, there's this anxiety monster in me. And so, you know, taking the adaptogens in the morning just like opens up this whole other world of like, oh, I'm gonna connect to nature and and feel connected to others. I'm reading this book right now by Simran Jeet Singh and it's, I think it's called The Light We Give. And it's all about Sikh culture. And it talks about the light that is in other people. And for through the pandemic, I had started saying hello to people and looking people in the eyes, right? Like we had masks on and gloves on. And so you really had to connect with people by looking them in the eye. And one of the things that I started to notice was people who were sort of down on themselves and, and you know, they sort of taught us how to see if somebody was smiling through eyes. And so when someone was having a bad day to really make sure I connected with their eyes, to be like, here's a little bit of my light. You're having a tough day. I want to I want to pass something to you. And it's in reading this book that I've realized it's light. And I find that connecting with people for me really reduces my anxiety. And I think it's because I feel seen. So I'm making somebody else feel seen. But selfishly, as I make them feel seen, I am seen too, which I, I think is one of my insecurities in life is just like not feeling seen. You know, I was like, I grew up, I was tiny, right? Like when I was a kid, I didn't hit puberty until I was 17. And I was just, I was born at the end of December. I was on the 10th percentile. Like I was just a little kid and I probably like insecurity from back then. It's just like, didn't feel seen. Cause like quite literally I was so short, you couldn't see me in the classroom. And so I feel seen and this, that connection outside when I'm doing well in the rest of my life just brings me so much light and life, which for me really helps reduce those anxieties. I love that. I love everything about that. I do. I do. I just love everything about that. <laughs> speaking of, of seeing and speaking of um, just showing vulnerabilities so others might also feel seen, you, you, you did a really um, heartfelt post about body image issues um, and body image issues and eating disorders is something that I see an awful lot of. Um, I have experienced it plenty in my own life, but I see it really rear its head during um, perimenopause and this time especially, like it comes up. And it's because, you know, our body, like we, we're used to looking a certain way. We're used, like, especially yeah. as people who are athletic, you're used to like, I put in A, B, and C, I get out X, Y, Z. And, you know, there's a yep. certain aesthetic that also follows. And yep. like you were talking about, like, I am as strong as I was, you know, not at 100%, but I have a lot of strength, but my, right. my musculature does not reflect that in the way that I am used to seeing it in the mirror. And that is a very difficult thing right. to contend with. And, you yes. know, you, you put up a very, um, I don't want to cry. <laughs> like I could cry. I'm like trying <laughs> not to cry. You know, it was just like, you, you put up a, talked about seeing photos from the world athletics championships that you just did you know in budapest an amazing event and that all that you saw was that your thighs had changed and how hard that is um yeah you know and i and i i don't ex 
well, if you have the answer, Sasha, kindly share it <laughs> but like, you know, with the world here. But like, how do you contend with that? Uh, not well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so there's that. Here's my, yeah. But here's my commitment. So, you know, Christine Yu's book. Um, yep. Can I think of Nick? Chris, do you know what the I've got her on the Thank show. you. Mm-hmm. So um, she talks about the dearth of research in productive health as it relates to sports science we're not addressing perimenopause right like we're doing a great job at like addressing like i don't know i don't even know what to call that phase right like the like post puberty things have normalized out you're competing and like things happen every let's call it 24 to 35 days depending on the human you are so step one my commitment you know working in the mental health and physical activity research center with one of the leading body image researchers in the world is to do research in this area right? Let's talk about some of those body image challenges. Let's figure out what they are, find some like grounded research, and then find the nuance so that there's some generalized tools, but some specialized tools, depending on who you are. How do I deal with it? Not well some days. And that's, I think that honesty is really important. I think it's okay to feel anguish around something that you don't have control of. I don't have control over this and you don't have control over this either. And normalizing that conversation already just takes a little bit of the pressure off, right? We live in a media and social media filled world, which is, it was filtered before, it is hyper filtered now, right? We're doing a project right now, looking at female and male AI generated images compared to non-athlete female and male images and trying to see if they continue to perpetuate stereotypes. The answer is they do, right? Light skin, degree of muscularity is high, thin, right? Light hair, um, generally blue eye or light brown eye. I think females in particular are expected to look a certain way um, and you have to manipulate yourself in a way to do that. When I was doing my PhD, I was surrounded by people at times that didn't believe in the project I was doing. And am I allowed to swear on here? Question? Swearing aloud? Oh yeah, of course, yeah. Okay. (laughs) Uh, I had to be like, I don't give a fuck outside of the circle of influence, say. Getting there was hard, years. And even as I moved through my PhD, there was challenges with that. You, yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna make you say that again. You you break you you're sometimes oh. you break up a little bit, and I don't know if it's not catching your. It's happened a couple of times, and it's not overwhelming. But like that was such a good sentence. I want you to say it again. The I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck with the people outside of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering right. if it's because you are you using the ear AirPods as a microphone. I am. You want me to turn it off? I don't want you to switch now because that the sound quality will change dramatically. Okay. But um, one thing I'm going to do is just turn my Bluetooth off on my phone. That might help. Um, Yeah. And see if that helps. Yeah, that could totally help it from doing that. But anyway, just go ahead and back to the, you don't give a fuck what the people outside of the sphere of influence say. Yeah. So I really, you know, outside of that sphere of influence, I had to just not give a fuck about what people thought because it was really putting pressure on me in my PhD to deliver something that my supervisor and I, in a sense, didn't believe in. And so relating this back to body image, the most important thing is that you wake up in the morning and you believe in yourself. And so the first like circle of influence is whoever you live with. That might be an animal, right? Like your animal, my dog needs to absolutely love the way I look. The best part about dogs, cats, animals, They don't actually care how you look. So no matter what, you're going to be loved. Um, But then, you know, my partner, he's been fantastic. You know, like every so often I just get this, like, that looks great on you. And, you know, he's not doing it in a way, he's actually doing it selfishly for him. He's like, man, my partner's still really good looking. I'm really attracted to her. But there's just something important about that in terms of like connecting with my partner. Like, listen, like, there's nothing wrong with being sexually, actually, there would be something wrong to not be sexually attracted to your partner. Um, so it, it is actually healthy to be sexually attracted to your partner. And so, you know, he's like, listen, your body's going to change. He's like, listen, I'm turning 54 this year. My body's changing too. It's different, right? Like 
the way men and women go through aging is so different. But, you know, letting go of the comparison on social media, but more importantly, letting go of the comparison of who I was before. Lauren Fleshman said it beautifully before she wrote Good for a Girl. And she's like, your body will become what it, you need it to become. And yes, like hormone therapy for sure is going to help, right? Like you're, when you sort of the menopot, and I think you've referred to it on, you know, the podcast before, you get a menopot because your body is trying to produce estrogen. It is desperately trying to produce estrogen. So it's producing fat because estrogen thrives in fat and that's how it's produced. And so it's producing fat to produce estrogen to try to like keep the things going that you're doing. And so if you can supplement, you you have to talk to your doctor. I've always talked to a professional, right? Like there may be other issues with the cancers and breast cancers, like be careful, don't self-subscribe here. Um, You know, like, but it's your body trying to produce estrogen. And so, you know, this combination of supplements, this combination of letting go of who I was before and being, becoming comfortable with who I am now, but also admitting that I'm not going to be perfect at that. And there's this also expectation and i think it falls more heavily on females this idea of like being perfect oh you know what everything's changing i'm just going to accept it you don't have to you have to accept it but you don't have to be perfect about your acceptance all the time and then finding pants that make me feel and shorts that make me feel powerful and strong doing the things that i'm doing i put on a power suit yep no that's that that is great and I, are you on um, estrogen? Are you on an estrogen therapy too? You had mentioned hormone therapy, so I'm curious. Yeah, so I'm on estrogen. So I'm taking pregnenolone. So pregnenolone, I'm not on a performance enhancing drug. <laughs> you can look it yeah, up yeah, on yeah. USADA. Um, pregnenolone is actually the precursor to building estrogen. So what we wanted to see was, could my body take the precursor for what estrogen is and still produce it? And the answer is it can, which is great, right? And I think it's going to, you know, extend the peri perimenopause, peri, almost called the peri monster phase. It's going to extend the peri monster phase. I'm renaming it the peri monster phase. Um, so it's longer, you know, before that moment of menopause and going into post menopause. So yes, I'm taking pregnenolone as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah and I, and I want to be um, also just clear for people. And I, and I know you didn't want to imply that if you take hormones, you won't get belly fat because, um, that's yes. not necessarily the case either. You know, I mean, there, there's your body is going to change for some women. I mean, the research is all over the map because all everybody over. is everybody is different. For some women, it can attenuate it somewhat, you know, yes. but like there's no magic way to like just stop the, the body composition changes. All the things that we talk about, the lifting, the exercise, you know, all the stuff that would stress hormone therapy for some, right. all of it can help. And also... I, regardless, your body, as we go through this life, yeah. is, going to, is going to change. I mean, yeah, irrespective of all those things. Yeah. And normalizing that, right? Like, I think, I think one of the challenges that I face, and I don't think I'm alone in this, is that we don't normalize change, right? Like going, you know, like if we look at like sports from like five years old and up, right? Like it's still very based on a male model, right? Like, oh, there's this linear progression and you're always going to get better and blah, blah, blah. Like we don't even talk about like at some point in female puberty, there's going to be a a plateau or a dip in performance. And you need to to normalize that one. And then how you weather that actually changes your trajectory. So if you try to stop that plateau and there's, listen, there's the standard deviation of someone who's going to go on that like linear trajectory, but it's a standard deviation. It's not the norm. When we normalize that, it is the takeoff from that plateau or that dip that makes incredible athletes. But if you go down the pathway of reds, as a female, you just can't recover the same way that males can. And we need to normalize that conversation. And we need to change how we think about long-term athlete development. So then as we like go through the phases and like men continue on this lovely steady progression, and then they have a steady decline where women, again, like you sort of have this plateau and or steep decline and just talking about that and normalizing it but one of the things i've sort of i don't like puberty and the like plateau and then the decline i had a plateau again and then i had a bit of a decline and like now that i've adjusted my training i'm also having an upswing again which has been super cool yeah yeah no i i it is so important too and that's why whenever people talk about you know they they throw these sort of blanket statements about age and performance and i'm like 
yeah, but you know, in women, it's real different. <laughs> like there's, there's a lot of those hills and valleys. And I, you know, I mean, that's why you see women in sport quite a long time, you know, performing at very high levels. You know, and, I, and you know, we talked about her before, but Camille Heron, Devin Yanko. And I think what's been, so Devin Yanko has been like my favorite story this fall. It's fall now, fall now, I guess leading into the end of summer. Devin had a terrible race about a month ago. She was just like struggling in her cycle, didn't have a great race. And that over the weekend, she qualified for Western States, right? And so normalizing that we're going to have bad races. And I think just normalizing that in general, like you're not always going to have a great race. And if you are, you're probably on performance enhancing drugs. And that's a whole other conversation we're not getting into today. But bad races happen. And to learn from them, you don't have to, you know, find the silver lining but you got to accept that they happened and move on and how you move on is going to be very different than like how I move on. But, um, I don't think we talk about how normalized it is to have a bad race as you're trying to figure your body out through perimenopause. Yeah. No, it's a, that is a really great point and that you don't need to. And I think these conversations are helping that. I, I think that there was an inclination to be like, oh, well, I guess I'm done now, you know, as opposed right. to like, there are things that we can do and no, you're not. It's just like, it might be a moving target for a bit, but yeah. there are definitely ways to smooth out the road in, in all the ways that you're, that you're illustrating. Um, I am curious, you know, what I, on your website and on your, on your socials, you make it, you prioritize rest and you prioritize sleep quite a bit. And those are things, especially the sleep part, that can really have a wrecking ball thrown into them, you know, during this time of life. And I'm wondering if you've had any challenges there. Um, yes. And I really have to figure out how to film this. So um, two nights before I get my period now, I'm awake. There is absolutely nothing I have figured out that stops me from being awake. And I also, for some reason, take the world's longest pee on this night. Somewhere around 2 a.m., for those of you who've seen Austin's Austin Powers, it's just like, is this ever going to end? Like, you're like, I, and you're like, okay. Um, so I had this night of disrupted sleep and it caught me off guard. I was like, well, I've done everything correctly. And it's obviously my hormones. And I, you know, I take collagen. Mo so I'm using, I use third Z, which is this great like combination of collagen, um, tryptophan, GABA and magnesium. And, um, one of the things that I actually struggle with, I'm laughing at myself is, so I'm still marathon training, right? So like I'm hungry all the time. Um, other things females generally struggle with is getting enough protein. And I was like, well, this is a great supplement. I can have a little snack protein before I go to bed and it helps me sleep through the night. But you know, those nights where I have that disrupted sleep, I've actually just come to accept it. So I definitely do all the things to like prioritize sleep generally. So like for me, it means no coffee afternoon, um, you know, trying not to eat a heavy meal, you know, particularly on that night when I know it's going to be disrupted sleep, um, reading, not being on social media, putting my phone away, um, getting into a relaxive state. So sometimes I'll have a bath, I'll have a cold shower, I'll have a warm shower, just whatever you need on that night. Um, but also knowing that missing one night of sleep is not a big deal. And so, you know, then, so I, often after when it happens, I'll prioritize sleeping the next night. Um, and thereafter, but I, you know, I think we got too caught up with sleep in the micro as opposed to looking at it as like a meso. And I think macro is too big. I think it's this meso. So like, what are you doing over the seven days? And so, you know, even if you have two missed, you know, two interrupted nights of sleep, like one normalizing it, being okay with it, as opposed to stressing out about it, right? Like stressing about it only makes the situation worse. And so um, I, you know, I don't have the thoughts of like, oh, I need to be doing this, this, and this. I just kind of lie at night, like being like, oh, look at that lovely ceiling. It's there. It's still there. I can still see it. Um, and I'm just sort of like become okay with it. And I usually fall asleep around two 30. I still usually wake up between six 30 and seven 30. And I'm like, well, I'm going to be a little grog here today and life goes on. And I just don't dwell on it or stress about it. I think that's awesome advice. I, I interviewed, um, a sleep expert who's who has a podcast and has written a bunch of books, Dr. Chris Winters, about that exact yeah. thing. And he said a lot of people get so and and as you mentioned, it makes it so much worse to like make it a catastrophe when you're laying there. Right. He's like people underestimate um and underappreciate the importance and the value and the benefits of just deep rest. He's like, even if like 
even if like the sleep is not coming, if you lie there and just, you know, count, do whatever, let your mind be calm, let your body relax. Like you are still getting a physical benefit of that. And, and it makes it less likely that you're going to like roll this anxiety into the right. next night, you know, and just like keep yeah. in your sleep because you're so anxious about, oh my God, what if I don't sleep again? He's like, that, that causes a lot of knock on effects as opposed to just like, like you're saying, this happens. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna rest, you know, and, and, and then go about your next day. When you bring up a really good point, and I'd be remiss not to talk about it, is what you think about um, in those moments. So um, growing up as kids, we alpine skied together. And so as a family, and so some of my favorite memories and like current memories are playing in the woods on my alpine skis with my family. And so those are the thoughts that I bring into my head because it's a it's a really calm, relaxing place of joy for me. And there's something about kind of floating through powder where you're like up on these like pillows that quite honestly puts me to sleep. And so I always picture, so in my head, I visualize these like tops of pine trees coming out of like light, fluffy snow. You know, my mom's up ahead because my mom never listens to us and always skis ahead and goes wherever she wants and we follow her. You know, my dad's off to my right. You know, my little brother who's like 30 is still 10 in these dreams. And we're just like, we're playing, but it's such a place of like calm. And I think, as you said that, it's actually a place of like, I think I naturally start to deep breathe, right? Like you're kind of like breathing with the turns. And so, you know, if I'm going to have to stare at a white ceiling, I'm going to make it white, fluffy snow. That's lovely. I love that. That is, that is <laughs> awesome. I sometimes, I sometimes think about um, mountain biking or riding in the same way. And like, I often yeah. will start drifting off and then I will fly off the trail and like literally like grab two handfuls of brakes you know what I mean in my sleep like my arms literally shoot out <laughs> and I grab brakes and I was like oh okay that's kind of funny okay. and then I just go sort of like right back into that state but that's yeah. I appreciate that Be before I let you go I want to talk before we hit record you had mentioned that you are leaving tomorrow for um a championship race again and that you'll be talking about perimenopause. And I'd love to hear a little bit about that for our audience. Sure. So I'm flying to Riga, Latvia for the inaugural World Road Running Championships. So this used to be the World Half Marathon Championships. And so to open it up, they've added a one mile. Uh, shout out to Nikki Hiltz, who is the current women's world record holder in that. They've added a 5K um, and they have the half marathon, which they've had before. What I think is there's two things about this event that are super cool before I get to the super cool part about me. Um, one, anyone and everyone can race in sort of the citizen races that follow the pro races. And so you can race, you actually could race all three. You could race the one mile, 5K and half marathon um, as a, I mean, you could as a pro if your team selected you, um, but you can race all those races as a citizen. So it's really drawing in the crowds to have them participate. Um, and I'll put like my sustainability hat on here to be like, how do we leave the place better than it was? Which brings me to the second point about the event is they have this really cool kids cup. And I think they've got 10,000 kids from Latvia coming in to run a five, to run a 5k. And I think they do that on the Saturday. And then I think the kids that aren't from Riga are being put up in hotels so they can watch the pro race and the citizen races the next day. And so I think it's just like a really cool way to engage everyone in the community. I am doing a video with world athletics on sort of like some of the, the gender exercise gap, let's call it. And so, you know, World Athletics is doing a lot of work around um, the gender gap at the athlete, coach, administrative level, but they also want to amplify voices of athletes that are talking about some of the challenges that we face with, you know, like the reproductive cycle um, and how it affects our training, but then also how we use it in our training so that we can become the best versions of ourselves. And so they're shooting a video with me and I believe they're writing a piece about how I sort of navigated moving through perimenopause and maintaining this elite level. By no means am I gonna be on the podium on sat Sunday, I'm raising Sunday, um, but you know, like I'm going to compete. I'm not going to participate. Like I am gonna go and put the best version of myself out there. And like, part of me is like, oh my gosh, I wonder if I'm gonna PB. Like, 
this is a really fast course and a really awesome opportunity. Like I had a really great workout this morning where like, I just felt fast and free and flying. And I'm like, okay, you know, like the opportunity is there. And so um, they want to tell this story about what I've gone through, but in a way that like draws the community in where like 50% of the world goes, is going to go through what I'm going through or have already gone through this. Yeah, that's super, that's super cool. That's very, very cool. And it's interesting to hear you talking about like where you are in this, because I mean, it sounds to me that, that as though you feel like you're on the, that you, that not that you're through the transition because you're not postmenopausal yet, but that you have found a way to sort of like dance on the water, if you will, like stay on top of the, yeah. you know, like to manage and to optimize yourself through this transition is that fair to say yeah and you know I think I have you know I've, it's been a privilege to be an athlete for the last a pro athlete for the last eight years and I've had access to great integrated support teams and doctors and dietitians and sports physiologists like you know I definitely am like ahead of the curve in terms of like access to information um, and then you know like I'm an academic researcher and so like I can you know dig through the research and see you know what's a credible study, what's not a credible study and, you know, and digging through the information. And so, yeah, I'm also like absolutely focused on becoming the best version of myself. And so for this right now it's in running. And so, you know, tailoring what I need, you know, I think about the book Meb for Mortals and Meb Kaflizi is an awesome example about keeping people involved in sport. And I can't help but wonder if like Devin, Camille, myself, you, and some other women need to write a book so that females have a resource that they can draw upon as well and not you know Meb is awesome but he's male and his experience is going to be very different than what we went through and because the female experience is so nuanced and has so many little differences I think it's really important to have a multitude of authors so that there is a little bit of difference in the story so that everybody can see themselves in it hmm. yeah that's that is interesting and I and I think that I mean, it's an exciting time to be, I mean, if, to be in this phase of life because, because these conversations are accelerating at warp speed. Right. And I, and I think yeah. that, and, and as much as I say that, I know that there are still women who are not hearing them. Do you know what I mean? Totally. Like, Cause I, you, it's very easy to get in your ecosystem and you step one step out of it and people are like, what are you talking about? And you're like, how do you not know? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just easy to like, it's easy to forget that there are people who are still not not getting the information because as mainstream yeah. as it is, it's not as widespread as it, it as it needs to be. And I and I think ultimately will be. And I think, you know, like one of the challenges, like think about medical education, like how much did they talk about puberty? Right. Like, I don't even know what the phase is. It's like post puberty, like the normal cycle phase. Right. Perimenopause moment like I didn't even know that the menopause is a moment it is just a moment yeah. in time and then you are post menopause right and so if the information isn't at the top and the information isn't at the bottom and there's those of us playing in the middle there's only so much we can do yeah before we need it to change at the top and we need it like sex ed curriculum right like so literally I thought my period was going to be like so like an egg falls down and I need a band-aid to deal with this like right well, like I had no idea, right? Like we talked about condoms and how not to get pregnant, but we didn't talk about, you know, the crux of like, here's some things that, that, that females are going to go through. And I think to normalize it and to destigmatize de it, the boys need to be taught this as well, right? Like to go alongside, right? Like the number of times, like growing up, I heard like, oh, that stinks. Having your period, you smell bad. You're gross. That needs to go away. And I think to do that, like it starts at sex education, but sex education should not stop at here's how not to get pregnant. By the way, here's what happens when you have a baby. Here are some of the things that happen afterwards. Oh, by the way, then there's this like later phase in life. It's like your kids are older and you want to kill them, but you love them and you can't kill them. And then they grow up and they move out of the house and then you're going to go through this phase. Like we just, we talk about it in such a like finite thing when it's this giant range of our whole life. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> As women's women are, we have a lot going on in our, in our hormonal journey and in our, mm -hmm. in our lives that we're not going to, we're not maybe going to solve it all here, but um, no, yeah, these conversations are a good, are a good start. Is there anything that yeah. we haven't talked about that you wanted to leave our audience with? Oh, 
No, I think we covered it all. I mean, reach out, right? Connect with resources, ask questions. Like, I think it's this like, don't be afraid to ask questions. One of the things I talked about with somebody else yesterday was like good vulnerability and bad vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. Like the crime scene is such a great way to describe it. Um, it's good vulnerability, right? It invites people in for a conversation. I'm a project and it's about youth sport, but I'm looking at things through an intersectionality lens. And so we're looking at the gender exercise gap through um, race and ethnicity, uh, disability, indigeneity, and social class. And I think it's really important that we, that I and we apply the same lens when we're talking about perimenopause. And so meeting somebody at the conversation that they're level that they're at. And so you might need to apply some modesty in your vulnerability because what we really want to do is draw people in. We don't want to push people away. And so, you know, if you're talking to somebody who's male and they're really uncomfortable about it, say, talk to them and be like, talk to me about something that's really challenging in your life. Right. And then you can find the shared, you know, experience of like, here's something challenging I'm going through right now. And it's my hormones are changing. And sometimes I just don't feel like I have control over my feelings. And all of a sudden you've drawn them in as opposed to being like someone who's really uncomfortable talking about the menstrual cycle. Like, oh my God, I woke up at a crime scene today. Like they are going to shut down um, regardless of gender if that makes them uncomfortable. And so it's, I think it's really important for this conversation to grow that we meet people where they are at. That's a great place to leave this. I appreciate you. <laughs> I appreciate, I look forward to following your journey and best of luck this weekend. Thank you. Well, that's our show. Come on back next week when I sit down with Dr. Christy DiSapri, who is a national leader in the field of osteoporosis and menopause management, and talk all about bone health. You won't want to miss that one. So come on back. And until then, as always, stay feisty. <laughs>been listening to hit play not pause a feisty menopause podcast for active performance minded women i'm your host celine yeager the show is edited and produced by the strong talented and amazing women at live feisty media follow us on social media at feisty menopause and please help us spread the word screenshot and share this episode on your social media channels with the tag at feisty menopause share the show with your friends and please subscribe, like, review, and rate this show wherever you get your podcasts. Word of mouth and good reviews make it easier for other listeners to find. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay feisty. Stay feisty.